So this is what we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully it's all quite relevant for you guys. It's a huge topic, so worth just trying to keep it to the essentials sort of for you as medical students and when you start as junior doctors. So main things we'll be covering um, areas regarding the postnatal checks. So we'll talk a little bit about the APGAS score and newborn resuscitation and the latest guidelines. Then move on to the newborn and infant physical examination, the NIPE, and then cover a little bit about the, some key neonatal complications and about newborn screening. Again, I'm not gonna go into huge amounts of details with this because I don't want to sidetrack you because there's so much to talk about. All right, and I'm just trying to keep it relevant. So we'll start from the first question. Um, just give you a little bit of time to read and have a think. Very good. Well done. So most of you got this one right, which is 2.7 deaths per thousand live births. Um, I'm going to be talking about these figures in a little bit. Um, you know, you don't have to know them by heart, of course, but it is worth just having an idea of what these means. And when we talk about neonatal mortality, um, we're really talking about um, mortality from day of birth up until 28 days after the birth. So it's actually a little bit of a longer period that you might expect you know, than just sort of peri-birth. Um, instead, stillbirth, sort of from 24 weeks till birth. Um, and I believe infant mortality is from 28 till a year of life. But when it comes to the neonatal mortality, um, it is worth bearing in mind, just having a vague idea of figures. Sometimes this stuff does come up um, in questions. And, um, you know, the trend in terms of neonatal mortality for the last sort of four years, has stayed pretty constant. It's come down a little bit. So it used to be 2.8 um, per thousand births in 2018. Um, but the main reason why this has gone up quite a lot, sort of since 2014, is this increase in births under 24 weeks of gestation, which obviously have a significant morbidity and mortality. Um, so the previous aim, sort of from England, was um, to reduce this figure by half by 2025, but this, this has changed now. Um, they've decided to mainly try and reduce the number of deaths per thousand live births when it comes to children who are born above 24 weeks of gestation, which kind of makes sense. So it's going to be sort of one death per thousand. Um, and the stillbirth rate, um, again, is still 3.8 in 2020, so it's still been up a bit. Um, I'm quoting Embrace here because sort of these figures, the reason why they're important is because they guide guidelines, audits, um, and in general quality improvement in neonatology. And um, so Embrace is, um, you know, sort of questionnaire <laughs> to try and uh, improve outcomes for mothers and children um, and neonates. So this all is relevant in this sense. So let's crack on the next question. Very good. Nice. You guys are pretty hot on this. Absolutely. So what we would use in this case is the APGA score, which is under one and five minutes. Um, yes, the APGA score sometimes is also done at 10 minutes, but it depends on the score from the APGA at five minutes. So that's a bit of a trick 
trick question. So we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about the APGAS score, but just to give you an overview, what it really is, is a scoring system, which is subjective. This is worth bearing in mind, okay? Which assesses the conditions of a newborn at one minute from birth and five minutes from birth. The score of five minutes is the one that's more commonly reported. The one at one minute um, is kind of to, you know, assess a progression of change, but is not taken as a figure on its own. It's a score of zero to 13 and, um, a score of sort of seven and above is, you know, a good score. <laughs> so anything in between that range, which is quite a wide range. So from seven to 10, sorry, I shouldn't have said 13, <laughs> it's up to 10, um, but a score of seven to 10 is normal. Um, it doesn't actually predict mortality or neurological outcomes, but it is sort of like a quick screening test to assess whether a baby needs resuscitation or any further interventions pretty soon after birth, okay? And you usually accompany this by checking the baby over and having a very quick overview to make sure there aren't any obvious abnormalities, any congenital anomalies that jump, you know, to eye immediately. And we'll come back to the APGAR in a second, but I'm just gonna move on to the next question. Okay, All right, this one's a bit tricky, but well done. The majority of you got eight, which is a correct APGAR. Fine, so talking about APGAR. APGAR stands for, I'm sure you've heard it all before, but worth bearing in mind, sometimes there's some exam questions that come up asking you what it stands for. Um, so appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. So appearance literally means what does the baby look like? And all these are scored on a scale of zero to two. Um, and for appearance, you'd be looking out for things like color. If there's any bluish tinge, which is very normal in newborn babies, you obviously knock off a little bit from the score. Um, the pulse, which is like a slow and fast. Sometimes this is hand measured pulse. So you'd be taking an ephemeral pulse. But the vast majority of cases, babies would have a SATS monitor just popped on, um, you know, kind of whapped around their foot or something like that. And that will actually give you a more objective measure of pulse. For grimace, um, this is just kind of their reflex irritability. Um, it's a bit of a funny word to say it, but it tells you, you know, whether the, the baby cries, if you sort of poke them, and if you try to um, do plantar stimulation. Um, then for activity, again, we're looking at what's normal with the baby, you know, in the context of a baby, but how much they'll be moving if they're moving both extremities or if they're quite limp or floppy. That's really the main thing you're looking out for. And then in terms of respiration, you're looking for any signs of respiratory distress. Um, so if they're not crying, if they have a wet cry or if it's weak um, or it looks like they're struggling to breathe. Um, and like I mentioned, it's worth bearing in mind that this is a subjective score um, and different professionals might score children on a slightly different scale, which is why, you know, we're taking sort of brackets um, in terms of what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, so like I mentioned, seven to 10 is considered a good score. Um, if a child scores below seven, then um, you repeat an APGAR at 10 minutes as well. And then we'll see, you know, there's interventions that you'll carry out if you think that a child's APGAR is not up to scratch. Now, when it comes to baby being born, other things you do after doing an APGAR score would be, so first of all, you get the baby, you dry them, um, you know, depending on the gestational age, say they're a term baby, um, you'll hand them back to mum, um, encourage skin to skin as soon as possible, um, and try to minimize any separation if you can encourage breastfeeding, 
I mean, it might be a bit tricky to start with anyway, but if you at least put them in their position, um, it's quite soothing for the baby. You know, being born is quite a traumatic experience. Uh, you know, do better in mind for mothers and for babies. Um, other things you do is recording head circumference, body temperature, um, and the weight of the baby. And then, um, yeah, I mean, obviously you want to do any of these things with consent and permission and try and minimize the things that you need to do at this stage because of this quite a precious moment for everyone involved. Now, if the baby's APGAS score, like I mentioned, is below seven, so, you know, something that's not quite right, there's a few other things that you might want to consider. Um, there's a series of conditions why you'd want to take paired called samples. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, it depends a little bit from trust to trust, but bear in mind, poor APGA is one of the requirements, but there's lots of other things like if the baby's had some meconium, if there was any query about sepsis, if you've had to take you know, fetal blood sampling beforehand, you know, there's various reasons why you'd want to do this test. And paired blood samples, blood cord samples, uh, blood, gas, blood gas is taken from the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery. Um, and they usually be done in, you know, you take double clamp the um, umbilical cord sort of before it's cut and take the sample from the bit in the middle so that you isolated it from the placenta and from the baby. Again, not routinely indicated, but if you have concerns, that's what you would do. Um, and then again, assess if the baby needs any resuscitation. Why is it that the APGAR is poor? Um, and if you do need resuscitation as part of, you know, you've judged as part of your assessment, then you'll be following the resuscitation pathway. Which moves us on to the next question. Okay, so this is quite a tricky one. I can see you guys are a bit divided between A and B. Um, so the answer is A here. And it is worth bearing in mind for neonatal life support versus pediatric life support, the figures are a little bit different. And there are some tweaks in terms of the head position um, for opening the airways, which you should know are different. So in neonates, for neonatal resuscitation, the chest compression to breast ratio is three to one and um, 15 to two is the ratio in children and um, so pediatrics but not in the neonatal period so I can see why a few of you might have gotten confused obviously 32 is adults and the other two are a bit so five to two is made up and continuous chest compression you only give if the baby is intubated and um, so three to one is the correct answer here now I'm just gonna cover a bit quickly this whole thing about new, newborn resuscitation because you won't really be expected to know this in detail. You wouldn't perform it by yourself unless you were doing advanced, you know, uh, pediatric support. Um, you know, you'll be expected to cover some basic um, you know, neonatal life support. Um, and so we would have to know a bit of this outline. So the first thing you do when the baby is born depends a little bit on the gestational age. So on a higher level, top things would be to dry the baby and perform the initial checks that we've mentioned. Um, so the APGAR and see what the baby's like. Now, if the baby is premature, um, this wouldn't be the correct thing to do. You'd have to put them in a plastic bag first. So if they're below 32 weeks, you put them in a dry plastic bag and put it under radiant heat. So most births will happen in an environment where you have a resuscitator at hand, which obviously is this little, I'm not sure if you've ever seen one, is this little machine look kind of looks like an incubator with a bed at the bottom and you stick the baby underneath and there's heat, there's oxygen, there's, you know, your pulse and pulse oximeter, all that kind of stuff. So this is where you'll be carrying out in a hospital setting 
some newborn resuscitation. So, you know, drying the baby, you reassess them because sometimes just a drying, you know, get the, gets them going. If that's not working, um, top things to do in pediatrics, worth bearing in mind for neonates and children is assess respiration. So vast majority of pediatric arrests are respiratory arrests, not cardiac arrests. And um, so the first thing to always check is that they're breathing properly. And to open a neonate's airway, so this is what I was mentioning earlier about differences between, say, children and adults, you don't do head tilt chin lift, you don't lift up the chin like you would do in older children, you just need to make sure they're neutral, and that's just got to do with the shape of the larynx and neonates. So, you know, don't touch them, just make sure they're flat, and that means that airway should be open. At this point, you would give five inflation breaths in air, so five rescue breaths just using, um, you know, just a bag mask. And you might consider oxygen and doing an ECG at this stage, but usually you start with five breaths in air, and the recommendation is always to start in air, and then you reassess. And again, now this reassessment stage becomes a little bit more complicated and a bit more subjective. You need to obviously act quite quickly, um, but you'd want to have two people there if this first stage has not worked. You repeat the inflation breaths. At this point, you might consider intubating, giving oxygen. Um, the other thing worth bearing in mind when it comes to newborn resuscitation is the heart rate at which you would start giving chest comp compressions. You wouldn't expect a baby, like I mentioned, to have a cardiac arrest. So like an adult, not to have a pulse. You would start chest compressions if the heart rate is below 60 after you've given two sets of inflation breaths. Um, so don't expect there not to be a pulse, basically. Um, and even in this case, before you start giving chest compression, you ventilate for another 30 seconds. And then if it's poor, you would start compressions at a rate of three to two. And you can see this narrative of always prioritizing the respiratory system first, because that really is the vast majority of, re of you know, the main reason behind the vast majority of arrests in neonates is respiratory rather than cardiac. Okay, and then you keep reassessing the heart rate every 30 seconds, um, and then, you know, escalate to vascular access of drugs if that's still poor. Okay, question five. Great. Yes, absolutely. So after birth, after the baby being born, the next assessment is between six to eight weeks. And that's um, the next stage of the newborn and infant physical examination. OK, so this examination is the one you probably most heard of. And it's usually the good old head to toe check where you try and really rule out any congenital abnormalities and any other issue with the baby. So the first check is done within the first 72 hours from birth, and it's usually done either by a doctor, if you're a Peter SHO, you'll be doing a lot of these, or a trained midwife, so depending on the size of the centre, or a trained midwife. And um, this same check is repeated at six to eight weeks, usually by the GP, or um, sometimes health visitors do that. So, um, and... Obviously, you would have heard about the examination, like I mentioned, sort of head to toe, but there's a few other things that go into this examination. You also be wanted to take a family, maternal, antenatal, and perinatal history and have it all documented. Um, at the second check, you'll take an infant history of what happened for those first six to eight weeks of life. And it's a great opportunity to address any parental concerns, obviously make every contact count. Um, and especially if this is their first baby, it's like they'll have a few questions. Again, pretty much every time a baby gets examined, you get a head circumference and a birth weight, and you'll be plotting that into the baby's red book. 
um, sometimes there's electronic red books now. And so, you know, just so you've got a record so you can check the trend of growth. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Oh, almost 100%. I feel like that 1% just wanted to try something different. <laughs> so everyone must have heard of these two uh, tests that are performed for developmental dysplasia of the hip. Now, the more interesting way to remember them is which is which, but we'll cover them in a minute. So I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail um, about, about the NIPE. Um, like I mentioned, it's good to have a nice systematic approach if you ever do this examination, if you've done it in your pizza rotation uh, or your next pizza job. Um, and you'd always start with sort of a general examination, general observation, and then move on to sort of head to toe. So when it comes to a general observation, what you'd be looking out for things like handling. Does a baby handle well? Um, and when we talk about handling, uh, which is quite, you know, a term that pediatricians use quite a lot, it just means sort of what's the baby's tone? Do they look like a well baby? Are they moving and sort of holding themselves the way you'd expect a baby to do? Um, this is a good stage to also look for jaundice, um, any odd behaviours and movements and what the baby sounds like if they're crying. Um, you know, is it a weak cry? Can you tell if something odd about it? Are they sounding hoarse? Anything like that. Now, you'll be looking out for head shape. So at this stage, you're looking for sort of plagiocephaly or brachycephaly. And like plagiocephaly is just very common. You know, babies' um, um, sutures are just not fused. So it's quite common that after birth, the head is just a little bit of an odd shape um, as has come out, you know, being pushed through the, the birth canal. But really, that should correct over time. And then when it comes to, you'll also be looking at head size. Like I mentioned, you'll be taking head circumference again and um, check whether it's proportionate for the body and um, check for fontanelles. Are they sunken, which is a sign of a baby being dehydrated or which you shouldn't expect you know, within 72 hours of birth or are they bulging, uh, which is a red flag for sepsis. Um, and then anything else in the face, it, you know, is it symmetrical? Are there any abnormalities? Now, as part of the face, you spend a little bit more time looking at the eyes and the ears. So looking at the eyes, you'll check for any odd appearance to the eyes. Are they sort of almond shaped, which might be a sign of trisomy 21. Um, and sort of the one thing that everyone always tells you <laughs> to look for is the red reflex. And it, you know, it's very important. That's why. Um, so the main things you'd be looking at for at this stage are cataracts. And so if you look at the little picture on the right, that sort of white, um, the absence of the red reflex, that's what it looks like. And sometimes it looks like that for both cataracts and retinal blastoma. So the absence of it doesn't tell you exactly what it is, um, but you obviously send them for a scan to double check. And any signs of infections, any crusting around the eye, you know, any potential um, sort of STI, they're being vertically transmitted from the mother to the child, um, like um, chlamydia, um, sort of infection to the eye, anything like that. And then any abnormal shape of the ears. So you'll be like looking out for, for things like um, sort of an underdevelopment of the ear, like in this little picture where the baby's ear is not fully formed. Sometimes it's just missing ears. Um, and then the classical one to look for is low set ears, which usually uh, look for in relation to the angle of the jaw. So how low they're setting, um, that's related to a lot of congenital um, conditions. 
And yes, a few more things, but those are the main hitters, really red reflex, are the eyes okay? And then what do the ears look like? Moving on, other things you'd be looking out for. So check in the mouth and try and have a look at the whole palate. Sometimes this is hard, it's a bit easier if the baby's crying, <laughs> or if you try and elicit this suckling reflex, you can sort of move the mouth around. Um, and of course you want to check for that reflex as well. And then you move down a little bit lower to arms and hands. Check that both hands are moving, check that both arms are moving. And this is a good time to check for any brachial plexus damages, um, sort of herbs palsy, any sort of limb sort of extended backwards with the hand flexed, anything like that. That might suggest sort of injuries during birth. And um, you also want to look at the clavicles here, um, which I haven't put in there, but sometimes fractures of the clavicles are quite common in birth. So it's good looking out for it now, because um, sometimes this is not documented. And then, although it is hard to pick up an examination, but if it's not documented, then, you know, it can come up later in time as a consideration for um, sort of a deliberate harm. Um, so it's worth kind of keeping an eye out for these things now. And then for palms, check for single palm acleat creases, uh, quite a big one for Down syndrome and trisomy 21. And then have a look whether there's any extra fingers or maybe some missing. Moving down again, um, we're sort of combining pulses in the heart, although I guess the heart is a bit higher than where you'd be feeling for a pulse. Um, yes, break your radi radial pulse, a bit hard to feel really in a baby. Um, femoral is the one you'd be going for um, really for the majority of the time. And it's worth checking at this stage if you can feel both femorals in order to exclude sort of coaptation of the aorta if one is weaker than the other, or one is absent. Um, and you know whether they both have the same character. Have a good listen to the heart at this stage and make sure it's where you expect it to be. Probably a bit hard to tell in a baby because whenever you listen, you're going to hear a heart, um, but it's a good, good time to listen out for murmurs. Um, the sort of typical murmur that you might hear is uh, sort of a continuous machinery murmur, which is one of the patent ductus arteriosus, which is very common in a newborn and um, sometimes takes a little bit of time to close. It is more common in premature babies, but hearing this murmur is, isn't necessarily a bad thing to start with, um, and it can be managed if you do hear it. Other things to listen out for are sort of ventricular septal defects. So have a listen for systolic murmurs and things like that. Okay, so while you're listening, you'll also be having a little listen to the lungs um, and check whether the baby is struggling to breathe at all, um, any sort of subcostal resection, tricky tug, um, and, you know, any stride or bit that should probably become a little bit more obvious before you listen to the chest. Um, and worth bearing in mind, things that can go wrong with the respiratory system are a tracheoesophageal fistula, um, where a baby sort of right after feeding, you might pick it up because they start coughing, vomiting, look like they're choking or going blue right after feeding. Um, so this sort of thing you'll be picking up pretty quickly as soon as the baby starts feeding. And it's just this abnormal connection between the trachea and the esophagus. Um, sometimes you have sort of a dead end esophagus, which is one of the more common types, like type C, type A, um, where sort of it just hasn't formed and sometimes you have this aberrant um, esophagus that connects the trachea a little bit further down. Um, I mean, I wouldn't go into trying to learn all the different types of trachezophageal fistula, just know that it's a thing uh, and that worth looking out for. Okay, so <laughs> keep moving down. So this is quite a lot to cover in this bit. Uh, so you'll have a look at the abdomen check the shape and make sure, you know, have a look for umbilical hernias or any infection. At this stage, umbilical hernias can be quite common. You know, you will do nothing about them until sort of fairly later on in their child's life to not a concern. Um, you know, inguinal hernia is a different story, but umbilicus, don't worry too much. Um, have a little feel, again, if there's any masses, but it should be nice and soft. Um, very important at this stage to look at genitalia. So this is a good time to assess for any ambiguous genitalia, 
and palpate the testes to make sure they're both there um, and inspect the anus to, you know, have a look if it's patent. That's the main thing you're checking really and whether there's, you know, meconium. There might be some there, it might have already passed, uh, but that's probably part of your history as well to just ask the mum if that's happened. Then you turn, flip the baby around and have a look at the back. A few important things here. Main things you'll be looking out for is spina bifida. Um, and that's where you know, there's different types. Sort of the main thing you'll be looking out for, I was splitting into two. One is sort of the obvious spina bifida, which is spina bifida cystica. Of, there's two types of it. There's a um, meningocele and a meningomyelocele. And the differ in a sense of, is it just the meninges that are sort of herniated? Or is there some spinal cord tissue as well in there? You won't be able to tell at the stage when you see your spina bifida. Um, you know, you need sort of further test for that. But it's all due to malformation in the spinal cord. So, you know, the vertebrae don't fully form and the tissue therefore can herniate out. Um, a more common but sort of harder to spot type of spina bifida, spina bifida occulta, which is where the skin is closed over the top but um, the vertebrae still have infused. And the typical giveaway, it's sometimes they call it sort of a hairy patch um, around the area of where the vertebrae might have not fused. Often this is a lumbar vertebrae. So you might see, you know, kind of a tuft of hair. And if that's the case, it's worth having a good feel to make sure you can feel all the vertebrae. If there's any missing, that's the potential sign that this is spina bifida. And um, spina bifida occulta doesn't always uh, lead to neurological sequelae, so, but it is worth noting. Um, other things, you know, you'll cover, you'll have a look at the buttocks, but I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. And yes, just have a feel down the spine, make sure it's straight and there's but aren't any other abnormalities, you know, all the ribs are there and things like that. Um, okay, so again, moving a little bit down, this is our hip time. <laughs> Everyone's favorite test, which babies despise, um, our Barlow and Ortolani maneuvers. So the order in which these happen and what they do is worth remembering. I don't know why this always comes up in questions, maybe because they're so memorable or maybe because everyone always gets confused. But the first step that you would do is you try to adapt the hips by pushing inwards and down. And that's Bala maneuver, where you're trying to dislocate the hip posteriorly to see if there's any dysplasia, okay? If there is dysplasia, then the hip will pop out and you'll feel like a little click. And the way you do them is you put your hands on the buttock as you're pushing down. It's a lot easier with a smaller baby than I'm trying to describe because you might not necessarily hear it click, but you might feel the sort of hip coming out of the joint. And then you open up the legs outwards. That's auto line maneuver where you're trying to, by abducting the hips, you're trying to relocate the hip. And again, you might be able to feel that with your hands and there might be like a click um, as you do that. Um, again, just a test worth knowing. And if, if you've taken a good history, sort of antenatal and perinatal, you will know the babies you definitely have to look out for when it comes to this. So breach deliveries, twins, family history, all that kind of stuff. Then last, have a look at their toes, see if they're all there and check for abnormalities like club foot, sort of when their foot is turned inwards and check that all the joints are moving. Okay. Last few bits are you just looking at the skin and some of these things really you'll be doing as you go along. You know, it's not like you do all that and then you look like, oh, now I'm gonna look at the skin. <laughs> you know? uh, but sort of on the back in particular, I mentioned there are a few things to look out for like Mongolian blue spots. These are really worth noting on your neonatal examination if you do see them, because later on in life, they're often confused or can sort of be confused with bruises, um, but they're very common in babies with darker skin. Um, sometimes they're at the base of the back or around the buttocks um, and they tend to fade by themselves, but they have this kind of quite characteristic blue tinge. Um, but sometimes because they're on the buttocks, they can be confused with bruises. So always worth noting if they're at birth. Other few odd things, I mean, 
oral cysts, not that common, but sometimes you might be able to see them. Again, they spontaneously resolve, but it's worth having a look because if they get found later in life, people might ask whether they're at birth, are they new, things like that. Um, capillary hemangiomas, like the one you see in the picture, are quite common. Um, you might have heard the name strawberry nevus, um, which is a type of them. They're a benign lesion, um, which often disappears over time by themselves. However, sometimes um, if they involve, so they're, if they're on the face and they look like they might approach the eye, then they will get treated with often propranolol, things like that to sort of try and shrink um, the hemangioma um, if it looks like it might expand into a sensitive area. Um, and then a few other things you might see on the skin, you might see toxic erythema, known as erythema toxic communitorum, which is just, it kind of looks like baby pimples, but they're quite benign. It goes away sort of, you know, within a few weeks from birth. Um, okay, made it through that. <laughs> so let's move on to question seven. Very good. Yes, absolutely. So antenatal steroids, mainly for respiratory distress syndrome. Okay. So just a little bit talking about respiratory distress syndrome, what it is. Um, quite a big hitter, so I'm sure most of you would have heard of it, but it is caused by inadequate fact and production. And it affects mainly babies who are born below 32 weeks of gestation um, because surfactant is produced in the alveoli from 30 weeks onwards. Um, so if you're born before that or sort of close to that time, then you might not have made enough. And surfactant is really important to keep the alveoli patent um, against water tension and like surface tension. Um, so if you don't have it, the alveoli tend to collapse at the end of inspiration, at the end of expiration, sorry, um, which makes them a lot harder to reopen next time you're trying to breathe. So, you know, you see this very typical labored breathing of children with respiratory distress syndrome. And um, it is worth bearing in mind that it can happen for any babies who are not born term. Um, so just because surfactant is produced by 30 weeks onwards, it doesn't mean that it's producing it enough amount to support uh, proper respiration sort of later on. So it can affect children, usually premature, but of later ages as well. Um, and typical things you're looking out for are intercostal and subcostal recession, grunting, nasal flaring. So all signs, you know, pretty typical signs in babies of increased respiratory effort. And the chest x-ray will have this typical, it's called ground glass appearance. So this really hazy uh, view with some shadowing, um, reticular nodular shadowing. Um, again, I think it's probably easier to, if you see a few of those pictures, that it will start making sense to you, but you really, it's a clinical diagnosis, not so much a radiological diagnosis. Um, so, you know, you'll be able to see it, you know, when the baby's struggling. And, Part of the treatment is giving synthetic surfactant and trying to get the baby to grow and sort of keep weight on so their lungs will develop and they will start making surfactant as well as they grow. Um, so the main preventative strategy is to give antenatal steroids. So these are offered between 24 and 36 weeks um, of women who might be going into preterm labor or are in preterm labor. So like I mentioned, you know, the the age gap at which you give it um, um, is quite, you know, it's larger than below 32 weeks. 
Um, it is important, this is two doses 24 hours apart. If you've only given one dose of steroids, you're still at risk of respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and the biggest effect is seen between one to seven days post-administration. So if a baby, you know, if you've given the injection and the baby's born a few hours later, that might still not have been quite enough. Okay. A few other top, you know, key neonatal conditions to bear in mind, um, which are quite common, might come up in your exams. Again, I'm not sure how much information you should go into these apart from, you know, being aware um, and know the main point is about them. Com you know, common things are common. <laughs> so meconium aspiration is a big one, um, has a high mortality, so it's worth bearing in mind and sort of tends to affect um, that sort of post-term births more than term births, but up to 25% after 34 weeks might have meconium stained liquor. Um, and, you know, if the baby does aspirate the meconium, then that's when issues occur, you know, just because the meconium in there doesn't mean the baby has aspirated it. Um, and the baby as well, if, well, you, you don't have to do very much, but um, that's one of the things to look out for when a baby is born and you do the APCA score, you know, if they have a poor APCA um, and you know they're post-term, it's worth sort of having a look in the mouth and see if you can see any meconium that they've aspirated that could be suctioned. Um, and any significant aspiration of, the, of meconium can be another cause of significant respiratory distress. Um, so yes, this is mainly sort of conservative management. So you resuscitate the baby and then observe them and so they go on and, you know, they might need some antibiotic cover. Um, so some mainstay of treatment. Um, ambiguous genitalia is the sort of thing you'd be picking out at the newborn and infant physical examination. Um, so again, you know, congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the main reason for um, ambiguous genitalia. So worth bearing in mind, but obviously there's lots of other reasons. I'm not going to go into all of them. Uh, but worth knowing that they're surprisingly not as uncommon as you think. So in one in 4,500 births. And last sort of group B streptococcus infection, which is the top cause of sepsis in the neonatal period. Um, it is a bacteria that's normally present in bowel flora and it can be, you know, it may well be present in the mother's vaginal tract. If there's any suspicion of maternal sepsis, antenatal sepsis, you know, mums would have a swab and then be given antibiotics, um, you know, during delivery um, to prevent sort of sepsis. But if mother is asymptomatic, you might not be picking that up until the baby's born because we don't routinely screen for it. Um, you know, unless there was a previous birth that had, you know, GBS. Um, and um, yeah, so if you have detected GBS before, you might be offered screening test and get intrapartum prophylaxis. But if you have any suspicion of sepsis, this is the kind of bug you definitely want to cover for with antibiotics and that are usually done with, um, oh, gosh, what are they called? you know, cephalexin and that kind of <laughs> antibiotic. I don't know why now the name evades me of a class of, anti class of antibiotics. But yeah, any broad spectrum antibiotics that uh, would cover GBS. Okay, moving on. Yes, well done. Absolutely. So audiology screening is the other top one together with the Hillprick test. Now, talk a little bit about newborn screening. 
We mentioned the physical examination, you know, that counts as screening, then 72 hours and 68 weeks. The other top two are hearing screening. Um, so offer to four to five weeks. And if that's abnormal, then you go for further screening. And the first screening test is um, otoacoustic emissions. Um, worth bearing in mind, this has to be in a very silent, quiet place to be taken, uh, you know, to actually take place. Um, so babies being, you know, in hospital for a while, not a great place to do this kind of screening. And then a heel prick test is the other big one. Um, so also known as Guthrie test, but we are trying to move away from this nomenclature. Um, and it's offered a five to eight days of life. It's important that it's done before the eight days because some things that might not be screened and you want to pick this up pretty quickly. And I would say probably for your exams, main things to know are um, really what tests are included in the heel prick testing. It is quite a common question. And also what's the path for hearing screening? So what's the first stage? Like I can mention autoacoustic emissions. And now you move on to some other responses worth knowing that sequence. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So sickle cell disease is definitely one of the ones that's tested. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the heel prick test because, you know, at least the name of the conditions is worth remembering, although some of them don't roll off the tongue very easily. So the heel prick test includes... Um, well, I'm just going to go in order through this slide rather than trying to summarize them, but things like phenylketonuria. So all of these are quite rare congenital diseases, but the reason why they're screened for in this particular test is because if you treat them, if you pick them up early enough in life and you treat them as soon as possible, then they can have very good outcomes. But some of them, if you sort of let babies get on with their lives without correcting the underlying issue or providing you different feeds and things like that, they can have disastrous consequences and particularly lead to sort of global developmental delay and things like that. So phenylketonuria, which is in the inability to metabolize the amino acid phenylalanine, um, is one of these tests and you know if you prescribe a baby a phenylalanine free diet then they can live a completely normal life but if you don't um like i mentioned they can have sort of pretty profound learning difficulties and disabilities later in life um, similarly with homocysteinuria um, which is an increased concentration of the amino acid homocysteine in blood and urine so again you'd have to have a um, sort of specific amino acid free diet. There's a few more coming up like that, but congenital hypothyroidism is another pretty big one. Used to be a very common cause of learning difficulties and quite profound disabilities, which is completely preventable um, by sort of, you know, correcting the hypothyroidism really early on in life. And it's quite common of one in 3000 births, um, but, you know, if a baby's born premature, you will repeat this um, at 28 days post the expected date of delivery. Um, but again, screened for, easily correctable. Sickle cell disease is another common one, one in 2000 births. I'm not going to go too much into this one because I'm sure you know what that is, uh, but another one that's screened for. Um, the other sort of non-amino acid related condition or non-metabolic condition is cystic fibrosis. Um, so cystic fibrosis is, you'll be screening in the heel prick test, um, but having a negative heel prick test doesn't mean you necessarily, necessarily don't have 
cystic fibrosis. And so it's worth bearing in mind that for any children for whom you have clinical suspicion for, you want to do a sweat test later in life. But at this stage, it's a pretty good screening. It will pick up a lot of the patients. Um, and worth bearing in mind that the carrier rate for Caucasians is particularly high. So this is the most common single genetic condition among Caucasians. Um, so it's in about 25% um, of the population. There's an innumerable number of mutations, although the most common to bear in mind might come up in exams is the Delta F 508. Other sort of metabolic diseases, um, medium chain acetyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, also known as MCAD. Um, bit of a rare disease, but because you can't convert, with this disease, you can't convert fats to energy. Um, very important for these babies to avoid fasting um, because they can go into very profound hypoglycemia and sort of hypoketotic hypoglycemia because they can't produce ketones. Um, because they can't metabolize fats um, and you know you can die from hypoglycemia um, so these babies are in pretty high caloric diets and a strict avoidance of fasting. Maple syrup urine disease another one um, where um, accumulation of amino acids can lead to encephalopathy um, again the brain injury can be irreversible. So if you pick this one up early, you have pretty good outcomes. And glutaric aciduria type one is another similar one um, where if you don't um, prevent it, you can you know, develop a neurodegenerative disorder, which is irreversible and progressive. Okay, 